Okay, so let's turn to Romans chapter 9, then we're going to look at this. Um, Janine asked me on the way in how many verses we would cover today, because like last week we covered zero verses, and today we're going to look at five. So verses 1 through 5, Romans chapter 9. So I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So after eight chapters of rather lofty, highfalutin theology, Paul gets down to expressing his heart for those who are lost. And he says that he has great sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart. <clears throat> and you see in your, in your Bibles, in, at verse 1, there's a dash. Because it's like, where is the continuation of his thought? And I think it's in chapter 10, in verse 1. He, sees, he picks up again, my brother, uh, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer for God for them the Israel that he's just been talking about, is that they, might, they may be saved. So his desire is for the salvation of his people, Israel. You know, it's, it, it's kind of interesting. He's, he doesn't say, um, I really hope they grasp the theological truth of everything that I've said. That's not his primary concern. His concern is for their salvation. Because it's easy for us to talk about the things of Scripture, but it's another thing for us to put them into practice and realize that there are lost people who need to know the truth that we hold dear. So notice Paul's desire for his people. Uh, he expresses to see uh, his kinsmen according to the flesh, the Jewish people. He desires to see them acknowledge Christ and be saved. And this is so intense that he speaks in a rather amazing, uh, an amazing hyperbole. Uh, he, he says he has great sorrow in verse 2. And that word great, uh, you know the word, you've used it before, it's the word mega. So he has mega maximum sorrow and anguish, unceasing anguish. That's a consuming grief. It's ironically the same word used in 1 Timothy 6.10, talking about the effects of a love of money. And he says, he says I have this, uh, this anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed. This is an intense desire, not I wish I may, I wish I might. It's a real longing, intense desire as a prayer to God that Israel would be saved. As I read this again this morning, I kind of get the impression that with Paul, this anguish is sort of always there with him. It's, it's kind of in the background. It's constant. <clears throat> and, you know, sometimes we don't think about it. We look at Paul and we look at what he did and what he experienced and what he wrote in the scripture. And sometimes we think that he is this big superman that he's impervious and nothing bothers him. Yeah, fine, throw me in jail. Yeah, fine, stone me. I don't care. I'll just go right back and preach again. But we forget that he was a real person, just like you and just like me. And he has this anguish in his heart. And he writes in one of his letters, he says, all of these things and besides all of this, the care for the churches. You know, Paul probably was a person who had a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say mental anguish, but a lot of things that concerned him. And this was probably always in the background. 
that he desired the salvation of his own ethnic kinsmen. And so intense is this that he says, if it was possible for me to be severed from Christ for their sake, I would do that. Now, we know that's, that's hyperbole. That's a, it's an exaggeration uh, for, this, uh, for the sake of emphasis, but it's a little bit more than that because he does assert the truthfulness of that in verse 1. He says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. Uh, he says, I am not lying. And my conscience and the Holy Spirit bears me witness. So while there is some hyperbole there, it's not all that much hyperbole. It's not all that much exaggeration. He is really intense. And when he says, I wish myself were accursed, uh, he uses a very strong word. He pulls a word from the Aramaic language that was common in uh, Palestine that day. And it's a word that you have heard perhaps, no doubt. It's the word anathema. And it, it, it means to, to, to be devoted to the direst consequences. I mean, it's almost like, like we would say uh, going to hell. He says, I would wish myself accursed and cut off from Christ. And he would be willing to be eternally damned if they could be saved. I, I think we just need to pause there for a moment and think about that. I mean, we know it's not possible. Uh, we've read chapter 8, and we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> but he's rather insistent in describing the desire of his heart. He's kind of making a big deal of it. Uh, and as I read that, I, I can't help but be rebuked by this. Um, I've never had that kind of desire for anyone to be saved. I have unsaved people in my family. I've never had that kind of desire. I hardly, and I'm going to be honest with you, I hardly muster up enough desire to pray consistently for them like I should. Not to mention to wish myself accursed from Christ for them. And for these people he's talking about, these are not necessarily his friends. These aren't his good buddies. These are people who opposed his message. These are people that every time he went to a Gentile city, followed in after him and tried to stir things up. These are the people who had him arrested in Jerusalem, and he's in a Roman prison. That's who these people are. These are not his friends, not the people he loves to hang with. These are people who view him as an enemy, and yet he desires that they would be saved. That's pretty intense. It's rather convicting, I will tell you that, um, at least for me. Now, understand also, he's not saying, I wish that the nation would be restored. But he says, I wish that they would be saved. See, Romans 9 is not talking about some restoration of national Israel. He's not talking about that. Because for them to be restored in their land after being dispersed... And, and be a nation again, not under the boot of Rome, but to be their own nation, for them to be that and not be saved would be pointless. They would still be the objects of God's judgment. I thought about that too. You know, there are some people, um, one, guy, one guy that I follow on Facebook, I mean, I follow people, I stalk people, I never post. So just understand that. So if I friend you, I'm stalking you. And so this one guy is, I mean, they're all about Israel. You know, he, they, they do the feasts and everything, and, uh, you know, they're, they're just all about Israel, as if the fact that Israel is a nation is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But they're still lost. They still need Christ. And that's what Paul's hope was. 
that his ethnic kinsmen would be saved. <clears throat> so after expressing his longing and his desire for Israel to be saved, he then recounts their privileges. He says, I had this desire and look at everything that they've been exposed to. And that even makes my desire much more intense. Who they were and what they knew and how they were privileged makes their estrangement from Christ even that more serious in Paul's mind. Here's, here are their, their blessings. He says, the adoption. To them belong the adoption, verse 4. Literally, that is the adoption of sons. And that reminds us of uh, the passage that was so, uh, so important to the Jewish people in, Rome, in Deuteronomy chapter 6. But if you move to Deuteronomy chapter 7, Here's what Moses said. God says this. Uh, Moses says this, the words of God to them. He says to the people of Israel, for you are not, for you are a people holy to the Lord, your God. The Lord, your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. That was their privilege, that God had chosen them <clears throat> and adopted them as his own children. But then again, notice what he says. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. That the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he's... Um, He's kind of hinting what he's going to say in chapter 9. It speaks of this exclusive covenant that God had established, this relationship that he had with these people, unlike any other people in the world. These were his sons and daughters, his own dear children. And why did he do this? Did he do this because Israel, as a people, were an impressive people because he knew that they would uh, be faithful? No. Why did God choose them? Why did God love them? Well, he answers the question. He loved them because he loved them. You say, well, that's no answer, but that's the one we're given. He, it, was his, it was due to God's good pleasure. And we see in Deuteronomy 7, hence of what will unfold in Romans chapter 9. They have the adoption. Then they have the glory. And you can read Exodus uh, 13, 21 to 22, which will tell you about that pillar of fire and that cloudy pillar that rested over the tabernacle and led the children of Israel. And they said they saw the glory of God. In chapter 25, uh, when they offered the sacrifice on uh, on the mercy seat, and the fire of the glory of God would hover over that. This was the continual presence of God manifested first in that pillar of fire in the cloud, and then by his presence as he met with Moses at the mercy seat. No other people were led like that. And of course, this speaks to us of the Lord Jesus Christ. Had the Israelites receive their Messiah, they would once again know the presence of the one who is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. They would see his glory, as John tells us, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They would have understood that all of those earlier manifestations in the Old Testament were just signs pointing to the Christ who would be in their midst. They would have known that, but they didn't receive it. The glory and then the covenants. These are the promises that God made with Abraham, with Isaac, with the patriarchs. Covenants are more than just promises. Um, I, I remember um, 150 years ago when I said my wedding vows to my wife, I said something along the lines that I do promise and covenant. 
So I made more than a promise. I entered into a relationship. They are more than binding promises. They are the establishing of a relationship. Recall the covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis 15. The promise was made between God and Abraham. And the custom was to sacrifice animals to, and it's kind of gru gruesome and gory, to, to, to cut them in half and lay half of the animal on either side. And then the two parties making the covenant would walk between those carcasses, symbolically saying that if I break the covenant, may my fate be the same as these animals. Except when the covenant was made, God put Abraham to sleep and he passed through those pieces, not Abraham, because Abraham can't keep the covenant. God guaranteed that he would keep the covenant. And the writer of Hebrews says, so it's by these immutable things that God who can't lie, he uh, made this covenant so he can't lie, but he also, he can't die. So the covenant will never be broken. And these are the covenants made to the people of Israel. So a covenant is more than a promise. It's the establishing of a relationship. I remember some years ago, I bought a car and uh, I financed it through GMAC. Little did I know I was establishing a relationship with them. That They kept it up and they contacted me every month for a long time. They expected me to stay in touch. No other family group or people knew a covenant relationship with God like this. And then he talks about the giving of the law, the worship, or the service of God. These were instructions on how to relate to God and how to worship God. Um, I've heard people give statistics. I don't know how in the world you'd ever count this, but uh, it's impossible to count the number of animals that would have been slain from the time Israel became a nation in Exodus until they went into Babylonian captivity almost 900 years later. Can't imagine how many animals were sacrificed. Did they actually think that the God who spoke to them from Sinai and the, one, the God who gave the law was was pleased with animal sacrifice? Did they think that he was a god like the gods of the other nations that needed animal sacrifice to be satisfied, that would be pleased with that? Of course not. All the sacrifices, all the sprinkling of the blood could not remove sin. In fact, the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10 that in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So the sacrifices pointed to something else because every time they made a sacrifice, there was that reminder of sin and sin was not taken away by the sacrifices. Well, it may have been covered for a while, but it was not taken away. And then they have the, uh, the worship and the promises. Uh, the promises specifically uh, culminating in the Messiah. And as he speaks about the salvation of Israel, I kind of wonder maybe if Paul doesn't have Genesis 3.15 in mind, that very first promise that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Then he says, to them belong the patriarchs, those uh, through who the Lord Jesus Christ would come. Why was Abraham called out of Ur of the Chaldees? to follow God? Why was Isaac born? Why were the Hebrew people established and preserved? That was done so that they would be the vehicle through which Christ would come in the flesh. And he did come. He descended from the patriarchs and he became the Jewish people's kinsman redeemer. But he's more than just their kinsman. Notice what he says in verse 5. This is an amazing uh, phrase here. He says, according to the flesh is, is the Christ who is God over all. He is using that phrase that he is God. He's not a God, but he is God. Christ is God. For any Hebrew who may be hearing these words, 
read in Rome, Christ is clearly identified as God over all, blessed forever. In one very concise statement, we have uh, the deity and the humanity of Christ clearly established. And so his point is this, no other people on earth had been blessed as had Israel. So one writer says this, the height of their audacious refusal of Jesus is found here. They were the original recipients of God's honored promises, and to them belonged the glory of being God's people. They had the covenants, the law, and the prescribed worship. These were all to prepare them to receive the promise of the coming Messiah. He came from their midst, and yet they rejected him. It's not as though they just ignored him or were ambivalent to him. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit had come, and he's preaching to these Jewish people, and he talks about Christ, and he, he doesn't tell them, he came and you guys didn't even pay attention to him. No, he doesn't say that. He says he came and you, by your wicked hands, you have delivered him up to be crucified. They didn't just ignore him. They rejected him. And so you read this, and it kind of reminds us of what Jesus said to those disciples after the resurrection, walking with them on the highway to Emmaus. And uh, he says to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Christ was clearly set before them in all of their scriptures, in all of their privileges. And so from these open words, opening words, uh, it's not an encouraging portrait. Paul's desire for his kinsmen uh, is intense. And yet he regrets their rejection of Christ in the face of all of their blessings. And so as he does this, he's anticipating an objection, as he does so frequently in the, books, in the book of Romans. He, he says in verse 6, it's not as though the word of God had failed. So if these blessings are given to uh, and promised to Israel, and if Israel did not recognize them, and if they did not receive Christ, then what does that say about the promises of God? Maybe the promises of God have failed. The next section, we get to the meat of the discussion uh, as Paul launches into an explanation of God's word and talks about the way of God in salvation. He basically will say, no, this is not a failure of the promises of God because we have to understand the purpose of God in all of this. And he'll, get, he'll, he'll launch into that in the next section. Okay, let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to at least uh, approach something of this attitude that Paul has, that we would have an intense and earnest desire for, for even our friends that we know who are lost to be saved. Uh, this rebukes us. This convicts us. So, Father, give us something of a burden, of a heart, to see people come to know Christ. I pray that that would be in our minds and our hearts. It would be our desire uh, to see the name of Christ exalted among many people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.